It, it was like, this was your chance, Josephus. Tell us about the miracle of oil. And, and he gives some other explanation, a metaphorical meaning of the light. And it's not mentioned at all. Right? And so how do you explain that? Did the miracle of oil happen? Shalom, this is Nehemia Gordon, and welcome to Hebrew Voices. I am here today with Rabbi Dr. Paul Shrell Fox. He is a PhD in clinical psychology from the New School for Social Research in New York and a rabbinical ordination from Machon Schechter in Israel. Shalom, Rabbi, Shre Rabbi Dr. Shrell Fox. Shalom, you can just call me Paul, that's great. <laughs> We're going to go with Paul for the rest of the time. That's great. Uh, so, Paul... Uh, what got me interested in, in talking to you was you had some information online that I had uh, read and watched talking about the pagan origins of Hanukkah. And what got me so interested is I've actually done a program on the pagan origins of Christmas with someone mm -hmm. who was an expert in ancient Roman and uh, Greek religions. Um, you know, it's interesting. People who watch that program come to different conclusions. Some say clearly he proved it's pagan. Others watch it and say... No, actually, the proof isn't isn't so clear. Obviously, aspects of it are pagan. No one disputes that, I think. But uh, right. um, there may have been some pre, uh, um, may have been some early Christian form of of that celebration. I don't know. I'm, I'm, we're going to stay out of that today, and let's talk about Hanukkah. Okay. So, uh, wh why don't we start with something really basic? What is Hanukkah? Let's assume the audience knows nothing. Uh, and tell us what Hanukkah is. Okay. Hanukkah is a, is a holiday that comes uh, basically at the darkest time of the year in the Jewish calendar in the Northern Hemisphere, which is probably an important thing to point out. As I imagine the person, the guest you spoke to about Christmas and, you know, I am thinking about the people who live in South Africa and Australia and South America. If they dream about a white Christmas, they're probably doing it backwards. But we should say that most of the holidays that we celebrate in the Judeo-Christian, including the Muslim, uh, Muslim traditions, emanated and, and developed and evolved over time in the Northern Hemisphere. So when I say Hanukkah comes at the height of the darkness, it comes at the height of the darkness in the Jewish calendar as it developed probably around, you know, 100 to 200 to 600 uh, uh, CE, maybe a little bit before, maybe as early as 70 CE, that's not exactly clear. You know, it depends on how you want to date certain things. But it's a holiday that lasts for eight days, beginning on what's the, the, the Jewish calendar, the 25th of Kislev, which usually comes sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas on the Gregorian calendar. And again, I'll, I'll say specifically that it happens at the time when the days are shortest and the nights are longest. And that'll be significant, but... Maybe before we get, get to, because uh, you, you're coming at this, uh, I understand, from the perspective of someone with a PhD in clinical psychology, and you mentioned to me before the program that your perspective is evolutionary, um, what, what was the term you used? Evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology. So I'll be honest, I don't entirely know what that is. I've heard of evolutionary biology. Right. I took it in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll let you explain what that is in a minute. Before that, I'm coming, my, my PhD is in biblical studies. I'm a philologist. I deal with, with history. And at, coming at it as an historian, um, I've got the events that took place between 168 to 165 BC, or BCE, before the Common Era. That is, the, uh, the Greeks wanted to stamp out the Jewish faith um, and impose upon the Jews, more importantly. I don't, I don't know that they necessarily wanted to stamp out the Jewish faith initially. Their main thing was to get the Jews to worship the Greek gods so they'd all have one culture. Right. Uh, it was assimilation. And um, the Jews resisted, under uh, famously under Judah the Maccabee. The Jews eventually defeated the Greeks, which was a big shocker. The Greeks were this massive empire. The Jews were not even what Israel is today, uh, was, was Judea at the time. And they defeat the Greeks, and they rededicate the temple. And then you have Hanukkah, which is the um, actually Hanukkah Tamizbeach, the dedication of the altar. That's the historical aspect. And then you have Hanukkah today, which is about lighting the, the candles for eight days, which isn't mentioned in one Maccabees, it's not mentioned in two Maccabees. So how did we go from that historical event, which was a dedication of the altar, to celebrating, um, you know, I say it's a very Jewish holiday. They're celebrating eight days of free oil, uh, or maybe you could say it's seven days of free oil. Seven days the first of free day oil. they had the oil. It was, was a given, yeah. All right, well, right. 
Yeah. So how, how, what's the evolution that went from one to the other? How did that happen? Well, I, th- I think there's, there's, a, there's a whole lot of things that happened between, between you know, the, the second century uh, BCE into the first and second and fifth century CE. Um, the, there is a story in one Maccabees, and there is a story which is reflected in one of the prayers that we say regularly on, on Hanukkah called Al Hanisim, which talks about a military victory. Mm-hmm. Are those one and the same military victory? The rabbis of the Talmud will tell us that they are. We have no way to know that for sure. And we don't really know whether at that military victory, whether there was that one cruise of oil that lasted for eight days, even though it was only supposed to last for one, or whether those two stories are conflated um, and, and not really clear. Right? The, the, Ex- explain what that means by conflated. So. Yeah. So we've got the historical event with the military victory and the rededication of the altar, and it's not called in in uh, or even today it's not called the the holiday of um, of of miraculous oil. It's called the holiday of Chanukah, which is the dedication of the altar. Chanukah to Mizbeach. So so explain the conflated thing. What, what do you right. mean by that? So, so what 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 happened? What seems to have happened uh, historically? Also look at Josephus a little bit. And he seems to mention more of a military victory and not so much about the, um, you know, about the, uh, about the cruise of oil, is that there seemed to be a holiday that was being celebrated around that time, which is where the evolutionary psychology piece will come in, in a few moments. Um, and it also seems to be that the Maccabees were saying, since we were prevented from offering sacrifices in the temple, at the time of Sukkot, which is an eight-day holiday earlier on in the autumn in the Northern Hemisphere, then this is in some sense coming instead of that holiday. And we're now, we're, we're now doing those sacrifices that we would have done in the temple, on the Mizbeach, on the altar, in Tishrei, which was about you know, three, two and a half months before that. And we're now, we're now making up for that holiday that we missed because at that point, the temple was not was not pure, and it was whole, it was held, uh, you know, by by somebody else other than the Jews. Whether it was Greeks, or whatever we, it, it, it will be who when any when any historian will say it was. So it, the the way the story is told uh, is that they went in, and there is some mention of this in the Talmud. They they went in and they saw and they put their their spears into the ground. And then they made, a, they made what looks like a Hanukkah or a Hanukkah menorah. And then they did this Hanukkah. In more modern Hebrew, now we'll get to the conflation, more modern Hebrew, Hanukkah is called Chag HaUrim, the festival of lights. Aleph Vavresh, or meaning light. And that also happened to be, as it were, uh, uh, around this time, uh, around the time of Hanukkah, which is, uh, again, uh, at the height of the darkness uh, during uh, during the winter. Uh, so, so you're saying, and, and look, Josephus is the first one, as far as I, I know, to mention the this idea of the, the festival of lights. Mm-hmm. Um, and Josephus, at, on, on the other hand, says not nah, a word about the oil. Right. Uh, first and second Maccabees say nothing about the oil. Right. But but so Josephus knows about the 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 the, the that it has something to do with light, and he actually has this incredible statement where he says, "I suppose it's because." Our eyes were enlightened with freedom, or something like that. I forget the exact phrase. Uh, right? Yeah. He, it, it was like this was your chance, Josephus. Tell us about the miracle of oil, and, and he gives some other explanation, a metaphorical meaning of the light. Right. It's not mentioned at all. Right. And so how do you explain that? Did the miracle of oil happen? Oh, I don't know what miracles happened or didn't happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wasn't there. Right. Okay. Right. So uh, fair enough. Right? Okay. So so then so then what might have happened sometime later? is like most highly edited religious and or societal documents, the Talmud had to worry about who they were dealing with, right? So the Talmud, the rabbis of the, of the Mishnah and the Talmud, which is about, you know, from about 70 or 100 CE to about 600 CE, were worrying about not so much the Greeks, but they're worrying about the Romans as well. And saying, you know, we don't want to put in their face this military victory. So let's come up with some other type of miracle. Yes, it's a miracle that we can pray about in our, in our, in our Amidan, or on our daily prayer. And we can pray about it when we say the grace after meals, the Katamazon. 
and we can talk about how we had this great military victory. But when we are studying our documents, we'll leave those things to other places in, in, in the text. And when we're going to say, what do we know about Hanukkah, we're going to make it a, a holiday of lights because in the heart, in the depth of the darkness, what you need is light into the darkness. And so we make this, we make this holiday as well as all sorts of holidays that happen at this time of the year having to do with lights. And this is where I come to the theory that likely what was going on at, in this part of the world, I'm sitting here in Jerusalem, at this part of the world, when the days were getting really short and the nights were getting really long and people didn't understand as well as we understand scientifically that that's just olam kemin hagon ohed, the world goes according to the way it goes, that they wanted to offer us some type of sacrifice and make the, 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 the darkness safer. So they were likely at some time, you know, around the time of 200 CE plus or minus, there were likely all sorts of holidays that having to do with lights. And since the only people who were around then, other than the Jews and Christians, were pagans, that's where I come to this, to the, to the, to my su supposition that Hanukkah is a, a, a conversion or Judaification of pagan holidays that were going on around the time of this uh, at the of the destruction of the Second Temple wow. and plus or minus. So 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 we've got to stop there for a second. You're saying so so let me let me see if I uh, I want to be careful. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Are you saying that there was a holiday related to a military victory and there was this other holiday? related to um, bringing light at a time of darkness and they were conflated into a single holiday or maybe they're the same holiday, but two different explanations for the same holiday. Well, and and how, how do you, what, what's your take on that? Well, the, yeah. I, certainly today and certainly mm -hmm. from, let's say, three 400 CE, we were talking about two different reasons for celebrating a holiday. Okay. It's not really clear where the Hanukkah was celebrated between the time of the first temple and the second temple in its time period that it is now. Right? Wait, back up. The first temple and the second temple. I mean, why would they celebrate Hanukkah? Exactly. There's a possibility they kept it in the first temple? You know, I, 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 it's, it's possible that they just sort of celebrated the military victory. It was, a, let's say, let's even say it was an eight-day celebration. And then they didn't celebrate it anymore. We don't have any particular... Uh, historical, at least from, from what I understand. You're the historian. But we don't have any historical... Well, so what I would cite is there's a document that goes back to the Second Temple period called Megillat Ta'anit, the mm -hmm. uh, uh, scroll of fasting. And, why, and, and, and what's significant about it is it lists a bunch of different days that it's forbidden to fast. Right. Because they're days of celebration. Right. And these are things that to us seem, you know, archaic because nobody celebrates any of these. One of them is Yom Nicanor, the day of the celebration of the defeat of the Syrian general uh, Nicanor, yeah. right, in the 13th of Adar. But one of the things in the list is the eight days of Hanukkah. So someone was celebrating it in the first Someone was celebrating it at, at some destruction point. Of the temple. Well, we don't know whether it's being, again, this is the second temple, the uh, Megillat Tanit, the second temple document, plus or minus, right. right? So when did it actually start to celebrate Hanukkah as an eight-day holiday now? I would probably, I mean, I know I don't know how to date it because we don't like I wasn't there for this miracle. I wasn't there when they started it. But it's it's clear that the rabbis of the Mishnah, and let's say yeah. 70 or a little bit before that, they knew about holidays being celebrated at this time of year. We don't know okay. if during the first temple or when the Jews were exiled and before they came back, we don't know whether there was a celebration of Hanukkah at this time of year. You know, I, I don't know all the historical documents from Bavel, from Babylonia, but I don't know of holidays being celebrated at that point within the Jewish calendar. Okay. Um, I mean, I would say that, that since there, there's no evidence to say they did celebrate it, uh, although it's a bit complicated because in Second Maccabees, there's the, there's the, the celebration of the Nafta. So right. there, is, there, there is some pre-existent form of, of a, a celebration related to light and miraculous light in particular, miraculous oil even, um, that's described in Second Maccabees, and it's tied in that it's when uh, Nehemiah, my namesake, uh, dedicated the uh, altar according uh, to um, uh, according to Second Maccabees. It's not in the Tanakh, but it's described there in Second Maccabees right. that they poured this uh, liquid on the altar and it ignited, 
uh, when the sun shone upon it, and therefore there there is this. They have this idea of celebrating for eight days based on that. Right. Um, so ex yeah, ex explain the evolutionary psychology side of this. So evolutionary psychology, what 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 we try to what, the way we try to look at um, uh, about human human behavior and human practice is we say what what might be going on that would that humans might, what behaviors might, have, might humans have adapted in order to exist and survive best in their native surroundings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so in general, generally speaking, we, uh, a lot of evolutionary psychologists will look at, at, at religions, religions in general, as some type of adaptation. Sometimes it's sort of taking a, a, a hitchhike but, or hijacking certain, but, a, a, but an adaptation in order to strengthen a sense of community between people who are otherwise unrelated kin, right? If you go back, you know, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 years, people sort of moved around in groups and they were probably related no more than second cousins to everybody who they were, who they were interacting with, right? And those groups have probably were about 150, 170 people. Once they got to be too big, let's say 250, 300, they would split and likely the splits would go according to people who were actual kin. But then at some point we had to, we had to exist in bigger groups. So we created this thing called religion, which then allowed us to, to say, okay, even though I can't identify any of my genes in you as it were, because I don't know how we are related biologically, I can look at you and say, okay, you are Jewish or you are this pagan group or you are Christian. And, and, and then, we, then we know how to trust each other even if we live at two different sides of, 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 a, of a country, right? So that's, that's how evolutionary psychologists typically look at religion. So now, we, now, how how might these two holidays have? Been? Let, let, let me stop you there. So one of the and you use the word supposition. I think that's very important. I appreciate your you, you laying on the cards on the table of of what we have as fact and what is the supposition. Right. So your supposition, I think, then would be that um, religion is grows out of these um, psychological social structures, mm -hmm. um, and uh, meaning that the 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 presupp maybe the words presupposition, the assumption here is that God didn't call down from heaven and establish any particular religion, right? That That's the assumption right. that... The assumption, that, right. Okay. I want to establish this. So if there's someone listening out there who says, I believe that God commanded the Jewish people through the miracle to light the, the Hanukkah candles, you can't say anything about that because that's a religious belief, right? I Meaning that what, what, you're, what you're offering is a... I'm not sure anybody says that exactly, right? Because... Obviously, it's it's takanot rabanim, but um, it's what we call takanot. But um, but uh, but if somebody believes in their heart the miracle really happened, then that's why we celebrate Hanukkah. You're not really saying anything against that, right? No, uh, no, absolutely not. No, I, you're I, I, looking for something in in human nature, I guess, and in human society that would spawn different religious expressions. Right. Okay. I, that that's an it's a very different approach than what I take. Meaning, as a philologist, I could hypothetically say. Uh, let's take Christmas for example, right? So Christmas, you'll say as a as a his historian or philologist, it's a pagan holiday. And here's a text I can point to that's that. Uh, first of all, I can point to a text that doesn't have it, which is the New Testament, right? Right. That's kind of important. <laughs> and then I can point to the what the the Christians call the Church Fathers, which is the first, certainly the first century after the New Testament, uh, or let's say after Jesus. Um, we don't have Christmas. So where'd it come from? And right. then I have this uh, text, which is um, which is a, cal a Roman calendar. And on December 25th, it says the birthday of the sun. So, right. so, so from a philological perspective, I'm pointing to concrete things. I'm saying there's an absence of it here, and there's a presence of it here. But that's not the approach you're really taking with Hanukkah. Well, well no, it, it, or is it? it actually, it actually it is. Because oh, that's there, what I want to get to as a philology. Now, now, now we can talk. Right there are there are a couple of texts. There are a couple of midrashim. Uh, mm -hmm. One is in uh, Abu Dazara idol worship, and one is in Taanit, where mm -hmm. there is a midrash about Adam Harishon, the first man, 
So what the rabbis are saying here, if I understand correctly, is that they look at Saturnalia and Kalenda, and they say these pagan holidays were originally, we can't call it Jewish because Adam is before Judah, right. but let's call it Jewish holidays. They were biblical or they were... So I, would, I, I would say even they were, they, were, they were holidays celebrated in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel. Okay. Right? Uh, probably at around, you know, somehow, somewhere around the Second Temple period. Well, there's two ways of looking at this. One is that the rabbis are right here, and there's a pre-Hanukkah holiday that was being kept for eight days. Um, and, and the other is the rabbis look at uh, Kalenda and Saturnalia, and they say, we understand where this came from. It's, it, and maybe even this is what's going on. They look at all these different cultures that Jews are living in in the diaspora, they're in Israel, but also there's Jews in Bavel, surrounded by Zoroastrians, and there's Jews who are interacting with the with the Egyptians, with the Copts, and there's Jews who are interacting with, with all these different cultures, and they say, wow, something like Saturnalia and, and Kalenda, these eight-day festival around the, the um, equinox exists in all these different cultures. It must be something that, that goes back to Adam Rishon, to the first man, and what Adam established for, for good the pagans have turned into something pagan. Right. And and so what, what I would say is your, your presumption that all these different cultures were celebrating holidays of light at this time of year, whether we were in Egypt or Babylonia or, you know, to the, as far north as we could have gotten at the time in Mesopotamia, and there were also holidays of light celebrated at this time of year in Eretz Yisrael, and the rabbis understood that the Jews needed to celebrate too. But we can't mm. allow the Jews to celebrate a pagan holiday or a heathen holiday. We need the Jews to celebrate a Jewish holiday. So now I remember what happened according to the history, or according to the history as I understand it, in Sefer HaMakabim. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, there seems to be some celebration around that time 400 years ago Let's put these two together. Let's call it an eight-day festival, coincidentally or not. And let's give the Jews what to celebrate at this time where we need to chase away the darkness. So, so it could be, from what you're saying then, is that there were Jews celebrating some, some uh, we'll call it proto-Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Hanukkah, maybe before it was called Hanukkah, right. for eight days around the time of, of the equinox. And then when the military victory that happened, they said, no, now we've got a really, this is a good time to celebrate eight days. We're celebrating anyway. We'll slap a new label on it. Right. So, well, so this is interesting. So, so this is almost the opposite of what I think is, is um, uh, what, what I thought we were going to talk about, which Hanukkah started out as a pagan celebration. And, uh, uh, and then it was turned into a, 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 an Israelite or a Jewish celebration. And you're, and maybe that's even true, but, but, before the time of Hanukkah, it could have been a, a Jewish celebration. That's but it, very interesting. It could, been, it could have been that there was something going on with 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 the with the Yehudim of Yehuda, right? Or they were Judea. more Israelim. It could be there was something going on, but I think that that's secondary to my point, right? Okay. If we wanted to say that there was a proto Hanukkah going on to to make it sound more Jewish, uh, I have again, I wasn't there, so I'm happy to say yes, right? But but I'm assuming that everybody was celebrating at this time. And, and, there, and the rabbis said in order, especially because we're about to, because the rabbis had some sense of, what, of the geopolitics of the time, at some point we're going to be really in a diaspora. Let's make sure, sure that when the Jews go into the diaspora, they have a Jewish holiday to celebrate now. If you want to really get into something like that, we'll come back before Lag Ba'omer and we can really talk about you know, how, to, how, to take a, how to take a pagan holiday and turn it into a Jewish one. But, uh, but we'll get to that another time. But, but the, idea, <laughs> the, the idea that I, the, the way I look at it is that the rabbis had a very important task. And here, now I won't, I remember one of my teachers who said it to me, although when I went back and said to him, did you ever say this to me? He said, I don't think so. But anyway, so either his memory has failed or, or my memory failed. But one of my teachers said to me, as I remember, it, is that the rabbis had, a really important task because they were setting up a religion that could be observed outside a native land. 
because Judaism, as we practice it today, is rabbinic Judaism. I, mean, I know Karai Judaism is somewhat different. Speak for but, yourself, right? But fair enough. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, By and large. But I was, as, as we celebrate it today, right? Okay. Judaism, as we celebrate it today, is a rabbinic yeah. Judaism, mm-hmm. right? And so rabbinic Judaism only grew up, which is, which is, the, which is the, 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 the turning point between rabbinic Jews and Karaitic Jews, mm-hmm. only grew up around 70 to 200. Right? Mm-hmm. At about the same time that Christianity grew up. Right? Mm-hmm. The, the, the laws of Kashrut were very different. There was no waiting six hours or three hours or even a short time between meat and milk. There's no evidence that that existed beforehand. In the Torah, it says, don't pick, cook a kid in his mother's milk. That's all. Right? There's no something okay. say we have to, to, we have to say we have to have two sets of dishes or two pots or whatever. Right, that, that, that's the, you know, how, how many times is it say in the Torah, this is a joke, how many times is it say in the Torah, don't, kid, don't uh, cook a kid in its mother's milk? It says it three, three times. times, right? Yeah. It says it three times. So the first time Moses says, does that mean we have to do it, we have to wait six hours? God says, no, don't cook, kid, cook a kid in its mother's milk. Does that mean we have to have two sets of pots? God says, no, don't cook a kid in its mother's milk. And God says, then we have to do sets of dishes. And God says, okay, have it your way. So, so I've told this joke, and the punchline, I, the way I've always told it, the way I w- it was told to me, is uh, I do whatever you want. Yeah, okay, uh, same idea. <laughs> so, same idea. So, so uh, how does lighting Hanukkah candles, Migaresh et Achoshech, drive out the darkness? Explain that concept. And, and look, you, you have this. You, you have... The Zoroastrians have a similar thing where they light they light some kind of fires, um, Christmas candles, Hanukkah uh, originally lamps, now candles. Right. What is the what is the evolutionary psychology explanation for this? Yeah. So so the, the if you look at the uh, original uh, practice of where the rabbis said to the Jews in Eretz Israel at the time. They were supposed to light their Hanukkiyot, their Hanukkah menorahs, outside on the street. And you're supposed to start to light them at, at the time that the business ends in the shuk, in the market. And the latest time you're supposed to light them is when the last people are getting home from the shuk. So the last people are getting home from the shuk, it's going to be pretty dark. And assuming that the candles are going to be lit for, let's say, half an hour or an hour, Right? They're going to put enough oil in there for, for it to last a long enough time. The idea here is I'm going to make a great effort, take a very expensive oil that's going to burn well, and make sure that I have very good wicks in my candle, even better wicks than one might use on Shabbat, and say, I'm going to light this outside. So I'm going to make a great investment for other people so that therefore they can walk home in the dark with at least their paths lit. lit. So, so the, 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 the initial halachot, the initial practices of lighting the, the, the Hanukkah candle was to light the way for people who are making their way home at this very dark time of, of the year. Okay, that's interesting. So, so here's a, and, and that's, I, I really appreciate what you shared there. That That's, I don't know if I agree with you, but it's very interesting. I love this perspective you're bringing of the evolutionary. Uh, th- this is an interesting uh, tool that I can add to my toolkit of evolutionary psychology. Mm-hmm. As a philologist, what I would, what I, the way I would look at it is there's this principle called sympathetic magic, uh, and you probably know about this from psychology as well. Um, the 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 form of it that I I understand is um, how do I put this? Uh, you you well, let's take an example. You want it to rain. So you pour water out and you keep pouring water out and you keep pouring water out and that somehow helps it rain. It helps the, the gods of the heaven, uh, the, the, the malachim, the angels, whoever it is, it helps create rain. This is a, 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 you could say a pagan way of thinking, but we do it today. And what do I mean by we do it today? Uh, and, and, and here we might have to edit this out, but hopefully we can leave it in. So in, in there's a... a Hundreds of millions of people who, when the man wants to get a little bit of help in the bedroom, he consumes the horn of a rhinoceros. 
And why does it consume the horn of a rhinoceros? It's textbook sympathetic magic. <laughs> to the point where rhinoceroses, rhinoceri, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, rhinoceroses yeah. are being made extinct because there's over a billion people who believe that if you uh, imbibe the, the, uh, the, uh, this thing that looks like what you're trying to get to, <laughs> then it'll it'll help you. That's sympathetic magic. Okay. So so the so the so Can the philologist if, if you if, if you eat that horn, it'll make you horny. <laughs> uh, not that you'll make you horny, but you'll you'll. I don't I don't need to spell it out. I hopefully for for the audience, <laughs> you'll, the you'll children listening that, eh? won't understand. <laughs> um, but you're you're trying to recreate that horn essentially. Let's put it that way. And so uh, I think the pagan way of thinking, the sympathetic magic way of thinking, would have been. The sun is dying. The days are getting shorter and shorter. We need to help the sun. The sun is a god, but it needs our help. Mm -hmm. And how do we bring the sun back to life and bring about its resurrection? We light fires that that uh, kickstart it and help it come back. That that would be the I think the historical or philological and, explanation. And, and they might and, both be true. I love that your uh, your and, perspective. And I would even say I would agree with that a hundred percent. And then what the rabbi's task the rabbi's mm -hmm. task was was to turn that into something Jewish rabbinically Jewish. But that's, what, that's, that's the way they saw their job at the time. In order to preserve their, even just sort of the, 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 the Pharisee type of religion, they said, we want to make sure that this is going to survive. And it's not bad. It survived, not with big numbers, but it survived for 2,500, 3,000 years. Right? We want to give these set of practices so that Jews rabbinic Jews maintain their Jewishness no matter where they are. And eventually they'll come back to Eretz Yisrael and continue to do this. And we'll come back, but we'll have something to take along with us so that we'll, we, won't, uh, we won't assimilate into the, into the surroundings and, you know, and, and, and celebrate all those other holidays which are not Jewish. Okay. Another thing the historians have pointed out, and I don't know if this is correct, this is what historians have argued, is that um, uh, originally Hanukkah, let's say from 165, where it was, it was the military victory, and it was a victory in a sense that celebrated the victory of the, of the Maccabees, who certainly from around the year 103 BC were Sadducees. Mm -hmm. And so some historians have suggested that shifting the attention from the military victory, especially when the altar's been destroyed, to the miracle of the oil was a, a strategy to um, uh, uh, take away, essentially steal some of the glory away from the Sadducees and put it upon, um, uh, not necessarily the Pharisees, but upon God. Um, and that now, is that really what happens? I don't know that we know enough to say that for sure. It's definitely a possibility. What we can say for sure is that none of our Second Temple sources that mention uh, uh, Hanukkah, we have... Um, uh, basically four, four sources, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, Josephus, which is kind of relied on 2nd Maccabees, um, and, um, and uh, Megillat Tanit. None of them mention anything about the miracle of the oil. The first time we have that is what's called the Skolion, the Gemara on Megillat Tanit, um, which is post-70 for sure. Right, for sure. Right. So. It's, you know, it, it's, they, it, it's given in a Braita, which is an external source uh, uh, contemporary to the Mishnah, but there's no way to know you know exactly when that was. It's it's you know it's it's post seventy. You know it's certainly not not most of the second temple, and it's certainly not any anything to do with right. the first temple. Now, on the other hand, the, the lighting of the candles or the lamps, right, not candles, right. that does predate the the story of the miracle of the oil. There's there's a machloket between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, which, assuming that actually is historical, puts right. it in the second temple period. But within the machloket, nothing is said about the oil. Right. right. The debate is: Do you start with eight and go to one, or do you start with one and go to eight? Right. And it has to do with with um, uh, the um, uh, with Sukkot, which is uh, right. which is exactly what we see in Second Maccabees. So that actually right. makes sense. Right. Right. Is that? And again, it's lighting candles, and then the rabbis take it to lighting the Hanukkah candles, which not clear whether that's what it was or not. Also, again, I think that the 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 the, the rededication of the temple, as I remember the description of that both in, in Maccabees and in, the, and in the Gemara, is that the Maccabees take their, 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 their swords and put them in and light a menorah. It doesn't say how long they lit it for. It doesn't say that how, how much oil they had, but they create a, 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 you know, a six-pronged menorah 
and 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 that's what they liked because that's what was lit in a temple. Well, I'm going to refer all the listeners to go and read First and Second Maccabees. This is your opportunity to see what the historical sources say about um, what happens when they when they liberated the temple and eventually rededicated the the implements. Uh, to end, could you uh, maybe uh, maybe we can end with a Hanukkah vort? Do you have uh, some some words of wisdom to impart to the audience related to uh, Hanukkah or driving out darkness or something? So. Um... So a, a good a good Hanukkah word is if and, and this I think will sort of mix all of all of, all, of, all of the things that go on in this crazy head of mine is that when when we're lighting the Hanukkah candles and we say lahad liknei shal Hanukkah and we say sha'asanesim we're commanded to light the, the the candles and the ones who does the miracles it doesn't matter to me Rabbi Dr Paul Shrelfox what's in your heart as long as you're doing it for yourself and for your community, right? You can believe that God commanded us, even though it's the, the, the question in the, in the Maraz, Hechan Suveinu, where did God command us this? Because it doesn't exist in the Torah. Hanukkah certainly does not exist in the Torah, mm-hmm. right? But, but if we do this in the right mind, and if we do this in a way that says, I am, I'm, I'm being the part of my immediate community, which we can call family, my extended community, which we can call my neighborhood or my surroundings, my overextended community, which we call the Jews from, from, from north to south and east to west. And then I would, I would hope that we would take it as a modern Jew also to say, yes, we have our own particular rights, but living in 2021, we also have to look at it as a universal. I don't believe the religions need to be universal, but I think all religions will give some type of universal message. And would that we could really find that universal message at Hanukkah time, at any time, not because I want to make a melting pot of everybody doing the same thing, but I think the mark of true diversity is that we each respect what each other's done, what each other's does. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiahsWall.com.